Today we're going to talk about both the nitrogen and the phosphorus cycles um, and how they interact um, with organisms, with the environment, with the biotic, abiotic worlds. Um, this is part of, this covers all of uh, section six for option C of the syllabus. Um, this first video is going to be focused on the nitrogen cycle and a second video will be created uh, separately for the phosphorus cycle. Hopefully these are able to clear things up and you can combine these while taking your notes uh, to clarify some points that might um, uh, be more difficult to understand. So nitrogen cycle, Nitro uh, just like the carbon cycle, um, for which I will also create a video just to give you a, uh, an understanding of that, um, the nitrogen cycle focuses uh, on the movement of nitrogen from the biotic into the abiotic, from ecosystems to the environment to organisms. And it's a matter of understanding how much nitrogen is moving and in what direction the nitrogen is moving. Um, and, and what happens, what are some of the consequences uh, when there's too much or too little nitrogen in either the atmosphere or in the, in the ecosystems. So the nitrogen cycle describes the movement of nitrogen within the ecosystems. This could be part of uh, within the organisms, but also um, in the soil, in the ground, in the water, in the atmosphere. And th the thing with the nitrogen cycle, which is a little bit more difficult than the carbon cycle, is the fact that there are processes that are involved here. And for the I at the IB level, you do need to know these processes. And we'll go through this separately. And it might take you a little bit of time to actually understand uh, what each of these cycles and how the nitrogen is moving. But the, the most important thing is to know which direction and from what that nitrogen is being converted and then into what it's being converted into. So at, at a overall picture, this is what the nitrogen cycle is. Um, we have, as we know, there is our atmosphere is 70, about 79% uh, nitrogen. There's only about 20-21% oxygen in the air. And when we talk about, if we're looking at ourselves, and, and we will talk about this when we talk about the respiratory system next year, but when we, when we talk about what we breathe in, we always say we breathe in oxygen, which is actually incorrect. We breathe in air. Now, what happens though, our, our cells and the movement of air across the alveoli is only permeable to oxygen and carbon dioxide. So the nitrogen that will go in gets released right back out um, and it stays within the atmosphere. But there are other organisms that are able to use this nitrogen uh, for other purposes. So at a very, uh, we'll look at this generally and then I'll go through step by step in the next few slides. Um, if you have this nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen, we want to go this way first. Um, there are nitrogen fixing bacteria that will actually take the atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into a form that is able uh, to be used in the root module. So this is, these are bacteria that are found in the root modules and they're able to use this ni uh, nitrogen um, uh, for uh, as a source of energy or as a source uh, for their functioning. The function that we want to look through is as, as we go farther down is the soil bacteria. So the nitrogen fixing soil bacteria are actually going to take N2, which is the atmospheric gas of nitrogen, and convert it into ammonium, which is NH4. That is the First, and we call this, this process is called the ammonification. It's easy to understand if you know that if it's called ammonification, the product is going to be ammonium. The next step that happens here, um, that ammonium, ammonium is not actually a form of nitrogen that is easily used by organisms. The more easily used version of this is ammonia as a waste product, but more specifically as a nitrate. So what has to happen here is there are other types of bacteria called nitrifying bacteria, which will undergo a process of nitrification, converting this NH4 into NO2. Now again, uh, NO2, not the best form 
of, of the oxygen fixated bacteria or nitrogen. Um, so nitri nitrifying bacteria will then further um, add on an extra oxygen, which will create a nitrate. Now, most times nitrates are not a good substance to have. If you if you think to a if you think to our um, axle oil tank, um, the majority, the type of waste that the axle oils produce is ammonia, and I, there are solutions that are added into the water so that um, that ammonia, which is not, it actually doesn't dissolve very well and it can, it's very toxic, that ammonia has to be um, converted into a nitrate. So I actually add nitrifying bacteria to the aquarium to produce nitrates. Nitrates are easily dissolvable in water, so when I do the water change, I'm taking away the waste material that is found in the axolotl tank. Now, this nitrate then gets assimilated in one process into plants, so plants use the nitrate as part of their functions, and eventually, once the plants uh, die out, um, they will decompose, or you'll have animals that eat those plants, and, and in, in, in succession, they'll, they'll gain um, that nitrogen that can be used for them. And again, once those animals die or the plants die off, you'll have decomposing organisms that are found in the soil, which will break down um, the, the organism. And as the organism breaks down, the nitrogen is released in the form of ammonia, and it just goes into this process again. Now, not all of the nitrate that's found here can be converted into, can be used by plants or animals. So there are denitrifying bacteria, which will then can take off this oxygen so that uh, the nitrogen can then be released back into the atmosphere and go back into the form of N2. So that in a general overview, this is what the nitrogen cycle actually is. So breaking this down into shorter pieces. So if we start with nitrogen gas, this is in the atmosphere. And I'll write this down here. Atmosphere, uh, approximately 79% of the atmospheric gas. Um, there are two steps that are going to happen. One, you have free living bacteria that are in the soil. So, so the free living bacteria are in the soil and they don't need a host and they convert um, nitrogen gas into ammonia, or as we saw in the previous uh, diagram, you have uh, bacteria that are attached to the root nodules, and those are mutualistic bacteria. And what happens is uh, these bacteria are actually producing nitrogen for the plant, and they're in a mutualistic um, interaction because the plants are then able to receive this converted uh, nitrogen into the roots and the bacteria actually receive uh, food particles and energy um, by being in this uh, mutualistic interaction. So it actually this symbiotic relationship actually works both ways for the plants and the, and the bacteria. So the first step is fixating this bacteria, fixing this bacteria so that it can be Atmospheric nitrogen gas, N2 gas, is not very useful to any organism, and it has to be uh, uh, it has to be converted into a more useful um, uh, into a more useful form. Now, the type of organism that is actually involved in converting a nitrogen into ammonia that's found on the root nodules is called is the bacteria rhizobium. And this rhizobium cannot work on its own. It has to be in a mutualistic relationship with a plant. Right? So what they're doing is they create these nodules right here. Red. And these nodules are centers for converting uh, from N2 into CO, uh, NH4. And what happens is the, this allows the plant to easily get its own source. Think about it as, a, as the plant's own source of conversion of uh, ammonia. And this goes to the host plant. And in exchange, because this is mutualistic, so both parties are actually getting a positive interaction here, um, the carbohydrates that are produced by photosynthesis, remember, because they're attached to the roots, they're able to tap into the plant's um, uh, xylem and phloem. So they're able to receive the nutrients just as if the nodules were part of the plant itself. 
So it, it acts as if it's an extension of the plant, it receives the nutrients from the plants, but it's also creating this nitrogen in exchange um, that provides the nutrients or the, the nitrogen, the appropriate type of nitrogen for the plant, and that can be used. Third step in this is converting or the nitrification. So you're converting the NH3 ammonia into nitrate, nitrite and eventually um, into nitrate. Okay. So this step right here is important because nitrate is the more common form, um, uh, more common uh, usage for plants. And then the final step to get it back to nitrogen gas, this is the very simple cycle, is to convert the nitrate back into a nitrogen gas, and this is denitrification. So nitrification is converting it to a nitrate, denitrification is reversing that process. Um, and oftentimes, because you're underneath the soil, this occurs where in pockets where there are, is an absence of oxygen. And this will then reduce the amount of nitrates that you have because you're then converting all of this nitrogen into nitrogen gas. And it gets released back into the atmosphere. Now, there is an inner circle here. So this is the very uh, cyclical version where there's no organisms involved uh, in the production or the usage of this nitrogen. But when we add the organisms into this, um, plants are only able to use um, nitrates. So plants will use ATP. So this is an active process because they're using ATP. that will then pump nitrates straight into the roots. So these are for plants that don't have the root nodules or they need more nitrates and they will use up some energy to pump these nitrates in. Now, the ones that have the root nodules, that is a passive process. That's a process that's just gonna automatically happen, but it's not a guarantee that they'll get, you'll get enough nitrogen. Now, these uh, nitrates are used for proteins as they are for us as well. You need the, the main component of a protein. What makes a protein a protein is the amine group, the NH2 group, right? And NH2 is the amine group, and this is found in amino acids. And so even with ourselves, we need to have some sort of some sort of source of nitrogen that can allow to create the proteins. So for plants, they will directly take up the nitrates. For animals, they will feed on these plants and then they'll digest it and rearrange and they're able to they're able to manipulate how they can use the nitrogen to create their own proteins. When both plants and animals die, and this is this dotted line right here. When they both die, they will produce detritus. And detritus is just an organic material that gets left in the soil. It is very nitrogen rich. That nitrogen can't go anywhere, it just stays in the soil. And then it can go back into the cycle or it can get converted. Um, so this detritus converts it back into ammonia. And then it can either go through this inner cycle again or the uh, it can go through this bigger cycle back into nitrogen gas. So there are two processes that can happen, but there's two cycles here, and there's an equal chance um, of each of these happening, but it depends on what is required within the soil environment and the ecosystem. And these are the names that are found here. So you need to know that this is fixation, this is nitrification, this is also, this is, this is actually just one step usually. Nitrate back to uh, nitrogen gas is denitrification. The, the wording that's used here is just based on what they're doing. So plants are uptaking nitrogen, they're taking it in. Animals are consuming the plants. Detritus is just the depth of uh, plants and animals. And then detritus will then decompose the organic material to produce and release the nitrogen into the soil. And that's what this looks like. So you can compare the notes that are found uh, on the previous slide, uh, on the previous slides, and look at this as a, this is the general overview. When you put everything together, um, the, if you think about it, it's very, it's a very logical process. It sort of makes sense. Some of the terminology is brand new, and you need to learn this. But um, if you think about it on a logical, in a logical term, it does make sense. Uh, 
a couple issues in terms of applications. Um, uh, waterlogging, uh, what happens is when soil becomes oversaturated, so if you have some flooding that's happened, um, or you don't have, uh, on farms where you don't have good drainage, um, you, you're reducing, so the increased amount of water actually creates a barrier for oxygen to get through. And what waterlogging can ha do is decreases the oxygen availability. Um, this anaerobic environment, so where you have no oxygen available, um, it promotes the denitrification of um, the ammonia. So when you have lower amounts of oxygen, denitrification increases in low O2 conditions. Um, and if the nitrates are, if you're, if you're if you've got too much nitrogen being converted into nitrogen gas and going into the atmosphere, then you have very little nitrogen that's found in the soil. And if you don't have enough nitrogen, nitrates in the soil, you're going to reduce the plant growth because the plants actually require this nitrogen to produce proteins that are required for growth. Um, and if you don't have enough nitrate, you're not going to have plant growth. Which is why on the very uh, on a lot of fertilizers that you find, um, there is a certain amount of nitrogen that is actually found to promote the actual growth of uh, the plants. Um, areas that have been waterlogged for a very long time uh, will have uh, will have nitrogen deficient soils that are that have stayed like that for a very long time. Um, some plants have adapted to become carnivorous and they obtain the nitrogen by a, a digesting animal. So it's similar to how us as humans, but also other animals, we take we eat plants, we eat other or other animals, um, and we take in the nitrogen from those sources. So something like a Venus flytrap, it has actually evolved in a way to get nitrogen in a different um, in a different mechanism, um, rather than just relying on um, a very nitrogen deficient environment um, and not being able to uh, obtain enough uh, nitrogen in that case. And eutrophication, this happens, it's a very cyclical uh, phenomenon, um, but eutrophication happens um, when there is an excess of, uh, of mineral nutrients. Um, and this often occurs in near agricultural land. And what often happens, and you've probably seen this, is you get uh, something called an algal bloom. And an algal bloom is an algal bloom is something where you have an increased amount of algae at the top of the surface of uh, at the surface of the uh, a lake or a river. And what this actually does, it can actually you may have an increase in minerals, but it can actually create a nitrogen deficient, sorry, uh, oxygen deficient environment uh, because there's there's less oxygen that can act uh, that can actually penetrate down into uh, the river. So you get light that is being blocked to aquatic plants. Um, and what actually happens is if you're, there's not enough light, the plants are actually going to die out. Um, and the oxygen demand is also increasing. So when algae are dying, they are decomposed by bacteria that are found in the water, which is a aerobic process. And you need a higher amount of oxygen that's found. Um, if oxygen is being used up faster than it is added, because oxygen is coming from as a photosynthetic component, um, those decreased oxygen levels will then limit the amount and the types of organisms that can be found in that environment. You should be able to answer the questions that are listed here based on the slides that were covered today. Um, and the next video will cover uh, the phosphorus cycle, uh, which is a little bit shorter, a little bit more easier to understand. It has fewer processes that you need to know, but it's an important component in terms of growth and the ecological balance. So, see you then.